I'm Robert Shapiro, Dean of the University of San Diego School of Law, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Bergman Memorial Lecture. The annual Bergman Memorial Lecture Series is devoted to issues concerning women, children, and human rights. This series honors Jane Ellen Bergman. She's been described as an ordinary citizen who chose to devote her professional life to public service. As a nursing administrator, public health educator, and family therapist, she developed an abiding interest in the human rights of common people, especially the plight of women and children in a rapidly changing world. This lecture series is a lasting tribute to Jane Bergman and an opportunity to hear distinguished panelists speak about issues facing society today as we navigate through rapid economic, technological, and political transformation. This event is an impressive partnership between the Law Alumni Association Board of Directors, USD Alumni Association, Hardy Legal Research Center, student organizations, and local community organizations. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the Law Alumni Board's Bergman Planning Committee members. I would also like to recognize our community partners, many of whom have partnered with USD School of Law's Bergman Lecture for multiple years, and some of whom we welcome for the first time this year. I applaud the student organizations joining us today. Attending class, reading assignments, and sitting for exams, though very important, do not complete one's educational experience. What truly shapes the experience is meeting and engaging with fellow students, alumni, and our on-campus and off-campus communities. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to feature you at today's event. I also would like to recognize and thank some of the members of the great team at USD School of Law who worked so hard to make this event possible. In particular, Sherry Bowerly Green, Jules Lapore, Kara Marsh Prophet, Liz Parker, Debbie Ryder, Jeanette Nichols, Mariah Alexander, Tara Murphy, Stacy Groff, and Mary Grace Braun, a second year student who is the judicial extern to Judge Daniel Butcher. Our 2021 Bergman Lecture focuses on the 1971 decision of the United States Supreme Court in Bivens versus six unknown named agents, with particular attention to issues of judicial engagement and law enforcement accountability. On November 26, 1965, federal agents entered the home of Webster Bivens. Without a warrant, they manacled Webster Bivens in front of his family, searched the apartment, and arrested Bivens. He was interrogated, booked, and subject to a strip search. No evidence of criminal conduct was found. Clearly, Bivens' constitutional rights were violated. The question was whether there would be a remedy for that violation. The fundamental principle that where there is a right, there must be a remedy is a longstanding one in Anglo-American jurisprudence. It was affirmed in 1803 in the famous case of Marbury versus Madison. Yet the lower courts denied Bivens relief. In a landmark decision, the United States Supreme Court reaffirmed that fundamental principle and held that it was the duty of the courts to provide a remedy, even without express congressional authorization. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Bivens, the case remains a landmark, but a landmark under attack. Recently, courts have retreated from an understanding of the primary role of the judiciary in vindicating constitutional rights. It seems now that courts may be less concerned with protecting rights and more concerned with protecting government officials. There's an increasing danger that for those in Bivens' shoes, there will be no remedy. The case thus remains of critical relevance for us in 2021 as we re-examine the importance of government accountability 
and the role of courts in protecting individuals. The case is also particularly significant for a reason that does not appear in the pages of the US reports. Like so many victims of misconduct, Bivens was black. He was a black man whose dignity was violated, whose rights were ignored. And the question was whether there'd be any remedy for him or consequences for those who violated his rights. The themes of the case are as relevant now as they were 50 years ago. There's much to discuss and much work to be done. Please join me now in welcoming our moderator, Julia Yu, a partner at Iredale and Yu, and president of the National Police Accountability Project, a project of the National Lawyers Guild. Originally from South Korea, Julia is the first woman and the first person of color to head this nonprofit organization. Julia also serves on the Board of Governors of the Consumer Attorneys of California and was recognized with that organization's 2020 Robert E. Cartwright Award for excellence in trial advocacy and dedication to teaching trial advocacy both to fellow lawyers and to the public. Ms. Yu. Thank you so much, Dean Shapiro, for that introduction. And I want to thank you and all of the organizers at the University of San Diego School of Law for hosting such a relevant and timely discussion today. Um, for the audience, I want to just remind you that during the webinar, we're using the Q&A function instead of the chat function. So it is a way for us to communicate and uh, look for your questions. In the Q&A, you can respond to questions and upvote a question by clicking on the thumbs up icon. We are about to condense a semester's worth of materials into 90 minutes. So it is a good thing that we have some serious experts in this field on our panel. First up, we have Honorable Dan Butcher, a US Magistrate Judge for the Southern District of California. Before being appointed, Judge Butcher worked in the US Attorney's Office, working in the criminal, appellate, and uh, civil division. And I'd have to say that nobody knows these materials better than Judge Butcher does. Um, I learned that the hard way, I would say, right, Judge? Um, <laughs> Judge Butcher is an adjunct professor at the University of San Diego School of Law. He graduated from UCSD for undergrad and from Cornell for his JD, where he graduated magna cum laude. Now, that is particularly uh, impressive given that he attended Claremont High School which is the inspiration behind the fast times at Ridgemont High. Second, we have Michael Marinin, who is an absolute institution uh, in this community. Mike is the godfather of the San Diego Civil Rights Bar. He has blazed every single trail. He graduated from University of San Diego for both undergrad and law school. And more notable than all of his successes, accolades, and uh, awards that he has received, I would say, are um, Mike's unfailing kindness and generosity to everyone in this community. Um, just by way of example, uh, whenever Mike has some free time, he likes to go to Africa to build schools and free clinics. Um, we are so fortunate to have Mike being a, such a strong mentor for the next generation of civil rights lawyers. Thank you, Mike. And lastly, we are so fortunate to have Benjamin Prado with us. Benjamin was a plaintiff in a Bivens action. He was represented by Mike Marinin. Benjamin came to San Diego in 1994 from Los Angeles to study poli-sci at UCSD. He is a longtime community organizer and a civil rights activist. Benjamin has been with AFSC, the American Friends Service Committee, since 2003. It is a Quaker organization dedicated to a just, peaceful, and sustainable world free of violence, inequality, and oppression. Benjamin has traveled to 17 countries, but back at home, he has been advocating for victims' rights for decades. And thank you, Benjamin. And thank you to all of the panelists for being here today. So uh, Judge Butcher, I think we're just gonna get right into it. So tell us what is Bivens? Yeah, thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, first, thanks to the committee for inviting me to speak to you all this afternoon. It's a great honor 
I'm also very privileged to speak uh, on the same panel with Julia and Mike, who both have very well-earned reputations in the legal community as prominent civil rights attorneys, and in addition, and equally important, as models of professionalism in the way in which they practice law. I'm also very privileged to speak with Ben Hameen, who's both a leader and an important voice in the community. So thanks to all of you. It's, uh, I'm honored and privileged to be with you. Um, as you can see from the cover sheet of the slip opinion, and as Dean Shapiro mentioned, Bivens is a 1971 Supreme Court opinion. And uh, it did two things, if we could move to the next slide. Um, it's not just a Supreme Court opinion um, that the Supreme Court decided. It became very quickly a shorthand way to refer to all civil rights cases against federal officers. And it's important to note that these civil rights cases are personal capacity lawsuits against federal officers. And what that means is that if found liable, the federal officers potentially could be required to pay in damages out of their own assets. So it's a significant holding, a significant case. Um, the main issue in the case um, that Bivens decided was may individuals whose constitutional rights are violated by federal agents bring a private cause of action against the agents? And the answer in Bivens was yes. It was a six to three decision authored by Justice Brennan and the court held that where federally protected rights have been invaded, it has been the rule from the beginning that courts will be alert to adjust remedies so as to grant the necessary relief. So Bivens spawned a whole category of, um, of legal suits, again, referred to shorthand as Bivens. And as we'll see, and as Dean Shapiro previewed, the answer has not always been yes and has increasingly been no. So I'm gonna get uh, all of you involved in the audience uh, right now with some questions for you. And these questions are interactive and wanna get your views on what's fair and how the court should rule because there are two sides to it, right? There's fairness to the officers in the situations where they should be liable or perhaps not liable and protected. And there's fairness to the, the plaintiffs and the victims who have legitimate uh, damages that they suffered when their constitutional rights were violated. So let's go to those poll questions now if we could. So the first question that I'd like you to answer, um, and if you know the answers to these questions, answer how the court should rule. If you don't know the answers to the questions, you're not familiar with the fact patterns, we're gonna discuss them um, as we proceed. Um, answer as you think the court will rule, the Supreme Court. So the first question, a federal officer conducted a warrantless search of Bivens, handcuffed him in front of his wife and children and arrested him without probable cause. And as we all know now, uh, that lead has been spoiled. Should the court authorize an implied Fourth Amendment private damages cause of action against the officer? So that's yes or no. The second question deals with a later case. Um, after nine, the 9-11 attacks in the United States, Department of Justice and Bureau of Prisons officials held Muslim and Arab men in harsh conditions for several months with no criminal charges. They weren't United States citizens. They were um, rounded up in the United States. And the question here is, should the court authorize implied Fourth and Fifth Amendment private damages cause of action against those officials? So that's a yes or a no. And the final question, a Border Patrol agent intentionally shot and killed a, uh, a young teenage man um, who had just run from the U.S. side of the border to the Mexican side of the border. So in the, sh the shooting occurred, the Border Patrol agent was in the United States and he shot the young man while the young man was in Mexico. So the question there is, should the court authorize implied Fourth and Fifth, fifth Amendment private damages causes of action against the officer? So please answer the questions. And then uh, when we have all the results in, we'll, um, we'll bring up the results. Are we able to bring up the results? I don't see them. We're just about at 75%. Um, okay.
All right, interesting. So everybody knows the answer to the first question. That's the Bivens fact pattern itself, and the Supreme Court did provide a remedy. Um, it's a slightly closer question with respect to the second question about the um, Arab and Muslim men rounded up after 9-11. Um, roughly two thirds in favor and, two -thir and a third believe that there would be no remedy in that situation. And then the last one, a stronger consensus for uh, a remedy being provided. All right, so um, not to spoil the lead, but the answer in questions two and three that the Supreme Court um, uh, decided was no. So there were no remedies in either of those situations. And I'll talk about those in just a few moments as we proceed. So let's then get back to the PowerPoint slides and take a look at the breakdown of the Bivens decision. So it was not a unanimous decision. It was six to three. Justice Brennan wrote the majority opinion. And uh, there were dissents by uh, Chief Justice Berger, Justice Black, and Justice Blackman. And we'll take a look at what the thinking was that uh, Justice Black and Blackman had and the competing considerations as we proceed. Um, so the first question is, what's the right, right result here? There's a fundamental disagreement about what result best serves the interest of justice. According to Justice Brennan, in the majority opinion, the very essence of civil liability certainly consists in the right of every individual to claim the protection of the laws whenever he receives an injury. But Justice Blackman saw it differently. According to Justice Blackman, allowing suit against the officers will tend to stultify proper law enforcement and make the day's labor for the honest and conscientious officer even more onerous and critical. So paraphrasing what Justice Blackman said and not using justice speak, recasting it in language that an officer might use, you mean to tell me you're sending me into situations so unpredictable and dangerous that you've issued me a bulletproof vest and a gun and you're telling me that I can lose my house if I make a mistake? Well, maybe this isn't the right job for me. Maybe I should have taken that offer to uh, join State Farm as an insurance adjuster. So that's the perspective that Jack, Justice Blackman gave as to the fairness of the result. So let's look at, next to a more abstract question, which is who should make this decision as to whether to allow these individual capacity lawsuits against federal officers? That, of course, implicates questions of constitutional law and implicates separation of powers. So let's take a look next at what the justices had to say about that. From Justice Brennan's perspective, it's, per it's a perfectly appropriate thing for courts to do and something that courts had been doing for many years, as Dean Shapiro mentioned. After all, according to Justice Brennan, historically, damages have been regarded as the ordinary remedy for an invasion of personal interests and liberty. The present case involves no special factors counseling hesitation in the absence of affirmative action by Congress. Now, there's a reason I highlighted under a line that last sentence, and I'll spoil again the lead now that Judge Shapiro alluded to. As you're going to see, it created a crack in the Bivens doctrine that the current court has expanded into a wide chasm that has largely eviscerated the availability of the Bivens remedy. Now, back to the separation of powers question, let's take a, take a look at what Justice Black's view was in his dissent in Bivens. So according to Justice Black, this is a legislative function to decide whether these types of lawsuits should proceed against federal officers. He said that although Congress has created such a federal cause of action against state officials, it has never created one against federal officials. If Congress wanted to do so, it could. But for us as Supreme Court justices to do to create these types of um, remedies is in my judgment, an exercise of power that the constitution does not give us. So you can see disagreements here as to the proper role of the courts as opposed to the proper role of Congress. So going to the first part of that, um, Justice Black referenced a federal cause of action against state officials. So what's he talking about there? Uh, Mike has a lot of experience in that area and I'm going to turn it over to him now to explain it to you in more detail. Thank you, Judge. Um, so um, we want to talk a little bit about what uh, claims people can bring against state actors as distinguished from federal actors. So we're talking about when we say state agents, who are we talking about? Local police officers and uh, sheriff's deputies, other governmental officials, as contrasted in Bivens with federal agents. 
So fortunately, in those circumstances, we have a statute, 42 United States Code, Section 1983. Uh, and that law was passed in 1871, after the Civil War, and back during Reconstruction. And we could spend, oh, maybe even a semester on Section 1983. Um, so, but I've, I've attempted to put it on one little slide here, which is sort of insane, but here it is. Um, Section 1983 allows folks who've had their right, constitutional rights violated by those acting under color of state law. So what do we mean under color of state law? What, we're, what the courts have said is that just means folks who are, who are engaged in state action, which translate to mean sheriff's deputies, local police officers, and other state or local uh, governmental people. So um, the other way that folks can vindicate their rights is through regular old tort cases based upon California law. So um, without reference to constitutional violations, California has a whole uh, panoply of tort remedies that folks who've been harmed by uh, folks like local police officers and sheriff's deputies, they can use the, the, the uh, California tort rules. But let's look real quickly at, at 1983 first. Um, first of all, the, the law that applies to that, we're, we're looking at primarily constitutional violations. And I put in the slide there, Fourth Amendment, because that's what comes up most. So when we think about a constitutional violation, false arrest, excessive force, uh, unlawful searches and seizures. Those are constitutional violations that come within the Fourth Amendment. But there are others. There can be violations of the First Amendment and the Fifth Amendment, the Eighth Amendment that applies to prisoners. Um, so it really is, uh, uh, there are violations that um, are, again, perpetrated by state and local agents, um, but they're, we're looking at constitutional violations. So how about where we have just negligence? Under 1983, that's not enough. It has to be an intentional act. Um, is the public entity liable? For the most part, no. These cases under 1983 are against individual officers. The only exception is a case called Monell, which says that if the public entity, the city, the county, as a custom policy or practice that caused a constitutional violation, the city or county can be, uh, can be sued. We're gonna talk later about qualified immunity. Qualified immunity does apply and is a defense to constitutional violations under 1983. Now, the, a very important part of 1983 is attorney's fees. So there is a statute that was enacted originally in 1964. It's, it's section 1988 of the United States Code. And that says that if a plaintiff prevails, the attorney can obtain attorney's fees for the time that he or she has put into the case over and above what a jury gives to the client. Now, let's look at how that contrasts with California state torts. Uh, on the right side of the, of the uh, screen, you'll see, well, under California, if you're gonna sue a government, you have to file an administrative claim within six months. And with some exceptions, if you don't do that, you're out of luck. So when people come to us and, and they have a, what amounts to a constitutional violation, but we wanna look at California law, the first thing we ask is, did you file a claim? And if it's beyond six months, we can't sue under California law with a few exceptions. And I put down false arrest and battery because when we're looking at those kinds of claims, they are pretty much very similar to what we see in the constitutional setting. But we can pursue those under California law as well. The big difference under California law is, yes, we can sue for negligence. So just a simple example, officer's gun goes off accidentally. 
Maybe that's not going to be a constitutional violation. We couldn't prevail under 1983. But negligence of any kind is actionable under California law. Is the public entity liable? This is a big difference. Yes. So, in other words, the, the San Diego PD, San Diego Sheriff, County of San Diego, they are liable automatically under California law if an officer um, is found to be responsible. Big difference under California law, no qualified immunity. And you will, when we talk about that later, you'll see why that's important. How about attorney's fees? For the most part, we're not entitled to additional attorney's fees. Attorneys can take a percentage, but, it, but only this one code section 52.1 um, has a provision for attorney's fees. And that is a provision that says if there's a constitutional violation by threats, intimidation, or coercion, you can obtain damages. So those are really the, uh, the two kinds of cases we have on, uh, when we're suing state agents. And uh, I think as we proceed, you'll see how it is different uh, to some extent when we're dealing with Bivens. Thank you, Mike. So I will turn it over. Um, so one of the cases that you handled was actually Ben Hamin. So I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about that case. Uh, so before we watch the video, let me set it up a little bit. On this day in 2002, Ben Hamin, you were a part of a coordinated effort by the community. I think you were documenting potential for abuses by federal agents, um, any kind of possible uh, racial profiling. So you, that was your intent to go out and record and to exercise your First Amendment rights. Um, Jules, if you could cue up that video of the incident involving Ben Amin. California, February 25, 2002. Hey, what's going on, man? Wait a minute. You're filming me. You're, you're impeding me. What are you doing? What's the Can you problem, talk? Man? Okay, hold on a second. I need to ask your citizenship. Come here. State your citizen. Oh, hey, hey, hey. hey. Asking a citizenship. No, no, no. I refuse to answer any questions. I refuse to hey, answer any questions. Hey, come here, Neary. Come here. Why did you fue detenido el 25 de febrero mientras grababa las actividades de la patrulla fronteriza en el sistema de transporte público y su equipo de video fue destruido. So Benjamin, let me ask you what happened after that day. So you were taken into custody, then what happened? Yeah, so it's really important also to really contextualize, you know, how is it that it, it got to that point, right? I mean, it took place on February 25th, uh, after, uh, in 2002, after 9-11, uh, there was a whole national security zeal to, you know, deploy agents, and uh, this agency in particular went out on the trolley racially profiling. That wasn't the first day uh, that, that we had had interaction, and as you mentioned, it was really important for us uh, as an organization to go out, go out there and monitor 
uh, the activities of Border Patrol because we were hearing that families were being separated, that people were not coming home. People would go to work, not come home to their children, uh, child care centers, you know, calling, trying to figure out what happened to their parents. And so we, we began to see a whole roundup. And so the, the second day that we, that we saw them, uh, uh, we actually were able to document it uh, with video, uh, through video. And so, you know, as I was detained, uh, you know, we had a community group that was already uh, organized uh, at the scene. I was taken to the Border Patrol, uh, uh, the Imperial Beach Detention Center process, fingerprinted, uh, thrown into a very cold cell, and which provided me uh, an understanding of what is the process that Border Patrol uh, does in order to, to detain, uh, once they detain an individual, and you know, I got to say that it was it was a condition of, uh, of I would you know qualify it as torture when you have a uh, air conditioning full blast uh, individuals who may not even have sweaters. Uh, and many times, as, as my observation was that there were even small children uh, who were in these uh, very cold cells. And so, to me, uh, you know, it, it, that they took me to this detention center, uh, uh, and because I knew my rights. Uh, I didn't speak to anybody until I was, uh, you know, and I requested to speak to an attorney. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that's really important uh, also during this whole process was that, uh, you know, it was right before the formative stages of Department of Homeland Security. And so immediately, you know, we got into communication, uh, um, not myself, right, because I was detained, but uh, our team got into uh, communication with uh, FBI's Department of um, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties to really denounce this. So, you know, had I had I not been a U.S. citizen, had I uh, not had a camera to document this situation, you know, had I been, you know, in the in the whether it be mountains, deserts, or any other community area uh, here in San Diego, uh, and and had been a, an undocumented worker, either going to going to work or coming back home. Uh, you know, this case would not have received the type of attention that it did. In fact, you know, I was accused of assault on a federal agent. And, uh, you know, I could, it, it could very well be that had I not had that camera, had we not been in an organized uh, capacity, and I could be sitting in a jail cell serving 25 to life because of assault on a federal agent. And, you know, the, the videotape was really critical for us uh, to retrieve and, and, and show, right, and expose uh, the fact that uh, being documenting or video recording a federal agent in the public right away uh, does not constitute a crime. But yet uh, the history of the Border Patrol in the specific, in, in various cases that we've seen uh, where, even there is footage of assault, of uh, even uh, torture, people being tasered to death. Uh, the, many of these cases uh, never get uh, adjudicated, never get to court. And so what we see is a is the whole history and culture of impunity that we uh, even uh, see in our in our current reality. Uh, there's more than since 2010, which is when we began to really uh, document and identify the number of agents um, that have been accused of, of, of shooting or killing somebody, there's been more than 119 cases, more than 119 cases of border patrol shooting and, and, and using lethal force and not one agent has ever been held accountable. The most egregious, Anastasio Hernandez Rojas at the border, there's video footage of it, and yet they were there was no prosecution of those agents. So what happens is that, you know, our communities have to continue to organize and build community-based power. And to the point where, you know, uh, where uh, that specific case, you know, even has had to go to the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights because of the level of impunity, right? So what happens, you know, uh, when people, uh, you know, many times don't even have the ability to uh, get an attorney, uh, because, you know, unless you have a broken bone, you have, you know, some serious damage, you know, it's many times attorneys won't take that, right? Uh, and so, you know, 
I was fortunate enough because we were in, as part of an organized process to have access to 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 an attorney. You know, and, and I appreciate Mike for that for stepping in and and representing uh, representing me. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's not just because those same agents, uh, you know, very well, you know, have been even promoted in many instances, right? So this whole culture, it's even rewarded many times when we have agents who commit these types of atrocities uh, and violate people's civil and, and democratic basic uh, rights. And yet, you know, there's no accountability for many of the, of the agents. Uh, and I'm not sure if you had a, another question, follow-up question before time expires here. You know, I'm sorry. There's some. I'm having some kind of technical difficulty. I can't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. I I couldn't hear. Oh, Ben. I mean, I'm sorry. Um. So I was just saying. Um. Thank you for your thoughts. I I think we want to have a little bit more discussion on those very issues about accountability. Uh, when we do some questions and answers at the end, I do want to take this back to Judge Butcher to ask the question. Benjamin's case was back in 2002. Since then, how has Bivens' cases evolved? Well, Ben Hameen, uh, in 2002, um, Bivens remedies were still generally available. He got in right under the wire, I would say. It's uh, in getting to the end um, where we'll end up. I, I would say there is a significant question as to whether Ben Hameen would have a Bivens remedy today under the current law. Um, but let's get back to Bivens and the immediate aftermath. Justice Brennan wasn't done after he authored the Bivens opinion. He wrote two more opinions approving of implied causes of action against federal officers for constitutional violations in different circumstances. The first case was in 1979 when Judge Justice Brennan authored opinion um, approving a Fifth Amendment cause of action for a plaintiff who was fired um, because the congressman for whom she worked Deem it, deemed it, quote, essential that the understudy to my administrative assistant be a man, close quote. And that quoted part, by the way, is an exact quote, not from the opinion, but from the congressman's letter informing the staffer that she was fired. So it was a little difficult to deny in that case that it was a gender-based action. So let, let's fast forward to 1980, um, just a year later, when Justice Brennan authored another opinion in Carlson versus Green, recognizing an implied cause of action under the Eighth Amendment for a prisoner who died because of a prison official's failure to provide medical care. So th these are the three opinions authored by Justice Brennan on Bivens. And not coincidentally, perhaps, these three opinions were, Carlson was the last time, and these three opinions are the only time that the Supreme Court has actually authorized a Bivens cause of action. So let's move next to the good news from the federal agent's perspective and the increasingly bad news from the plaintiff's perspective and wrap it up by summarizing where Bivens stands today. So recall the underlying language that I emphasize when we discuss Bivens. The present case involves no special factors, counseling hesitation and the absence of affirmative action by Congress. And that's what Justice Brennan wrote. Now let's take a look at how the Supreme Court in future cases has used this language to essentially turn it against Justice Brennan in a way that likely he didn't intend um, and not only cut back, but ultimately come very close to limiting Bivens to its facts. And 1983, in a case called Chappelle versus Wallace, which was a unanimous opinion, even Justice Brennan still on the court, even concurred in that opinion. And um, the holding there was that there's no Bivens remedy for enlisted military personnel alleging race discrimination by superior officers. So what Justice Berger wrote, who wrote that opinion, Chief Justice Berger, and what even Justice Brennan agreed was that there's a special nature of military life, but now you're seeing a special factors creep up again that Justice Brennan initially mentioned in Bivens itself the need for unhesitating and decisive action by military officers and equally disciplined responses by enlisted personnel would be undermined by a judicially created remedy exposing officers to potential liability at the hands of those they are charged to command. So that's not particularly controversial, even in the eyes of Justice Brennan. Civilian courts aren't going to provide a forum to challenge internal military, military order and discipline. So let's take a look next though, and we'll see Bivens being limited in some other contexts.
So the next case was in 1988 in a case called Schweiker versus Chiliki. And that was a six to three opinion authored by Justice O'Connor to which Justice Brennan dissented. And the finding there was that there's no Bivens remedy for social security rep recipients for constitutional violations by social security administrators because Congress had provided a remedy in the Social Security Act. So what the Supreme Court did in Schweiker was take a look at the Social Security Act, observe the Congress has provided an elaborate remedial scheme for disappointed social security applicants to challenge the denial of benefits and said that Congress has spoken as to what the available remedies are. So um, the Supreme Court is not going to allow it. What Chief Justice said about that was this is another special factor of counseling hesitation in the absence of affirmative action by Congress. Has proved to be, um, Congress action has proved to include an appropriate judicial deference to indications that congressional act inaction has not been inadvertent. So now we're looking back at the Bivens opinion and the court has held that non-inadvertent congressional inaction can be a res reason to deny a Bivens remedy. So let's fast forward next to the 21st century, right before Ben Amin's case in 2001, we now have a new justice on the Supreme Court and a new approach to implied causes of action. In Malesko, it was a five to four decision authored by Chief Justice Rehnquist. The court denied a Bivens cause of action to prisoners who rights were violated by private prison employees. Now this result is not necessarily a fatal blow to Bivens either because private employees aren't federal employees and a plaintiff, as Mike mentioned, might be able to just sue them in state court. But let's look at, take a look at what Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas said in a concurrence where they expressed their fundamental disagreement with Bivens itself. What they said was that Bivens is a relic of the heady days in which this court assumed common law powers to create causes of action, decreeing them to be implied by the mere existence of a statutory or constitutional pro prohibition. And he, they, he wrote that subsequently, the Supreme Court has abandoned that power to invent these implications in the statutory field. And there's even greater reason to abandon it in the constitutional field, since an implication imagined in the constitution can pre presumably not even be repudiated by Congress. So in other words, Justices Scalia and Thomas describe Bivens as the product of 1970s troglodyte justices who arrogated power to themselves, but more properly belong to Congress. And that last sentence is really interesting. Their point there is that if the remedy is implied under the constitution, because it's constitutional, not even Congress can eliminate it by legislation. Now, if you read Bivens, that's very clearly not what Justice Brennan had in mind, but it's an interesting food for thought because Bivens has been described as an implied remedy under the Constitution. So let's get to the bottom line um, where things really unraveled from the plaintiff's perspective in Bivens in 2017 in a case called Ziegler versus Abbasi. Now this case um, was a Bivens case brought by, um, and this is one of the hypos that you saw, um, six Arab and Muslim men who um, were not United States citizens held without criminal charges for extended um, a period of time in conditions that they described as deplorable. And Ben Hameen mentioned some of the conditions that uh, he endured and they were being held in the New York Metropolitan Correctional Center. And the court held in that situation four to two um, in an opinion authored by Justice Kennedy um, that there was no Bivens remedy in that situation. In the process though, the court completely changed the Bivens landscape. First, the concurrence of Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas that we just saw in the Malesko case that, um, in that last slide is now adopted as part of the majority opinion. The majority wrote that Bivens is a relic of the ancien regime. They didn't have the T in there, it's ancien, where, when the court followed a different approach to recognizing implied causes of action than it follows now. And the court went even further. It said now that expanding the Bivens remedy is disfavored judicial activity. So the message to the lower courts is now clear. If you as a lower court judge, a district judge, are considering expanding Bivens to a new context, know that what you're doing is engaging in disfavored judicial activity. And as we'll see in the next slide, the separation of powers concerns that we first saw in Justice Black's dissent in Bivens are now the majority view of the court. In Abbasi, the court wrote, most often it should be Congress, not the courts who should decide whether and how to provide a damages remedy, because when an issue involves a host of considerations that must be weighed and appraised, it should be committed to those who write the laws rather than those who interpret them. So now let's next take a look at the new test 
in Abbasi for courts to apply and determining whether to allow a Bivens case to leave the starting gates at all. And the first test is, does the complaint present a new Bivens context? And the answer is, is to a judge who is applying that test, if the case is different a meaningful way from previous cases, um, Bivens cases approved by the Supreme Court, then the context is new. And they're referring to Supreme Court cases there, which is significant because as we've seen, the Supreme Court has only approved the Bivens remedy three times, those three opinions authored by Justice Brennan. So virtually every case is going to be different, at least on its facts. So, and if it is different, and the Supreme Court said that even a small difference is a significant enough difference, enough difference to proceed to step two of the test, which is that special factors analysis that again, we first saw in Justice Brennan's Bivens opinion. So the second part of the test is the special factors inquiry. Are there special factors counseling hesitation? And according to the Supreme Court, that inquiry must concentrate on whether the judiciary, as opposed to Congress, absent congressional action or instruction to consider and weigh the costs and benefits of allowing a damages action to proceed. So in other words, in some respects, courts aren't even competent to even perform this special factors test if doing so requires balancing the special factors that constitute costs and benefits going both ways. And this is the test re restated in the second quote. If there's sound reasons to think that Congress might doubt the efficacy or necessity of a damages remedy as part of a system for enforcing the law and correcting the wrong, the courts must refrain from creating that remedy in order to respect the role of Congress in determining the nature and extent of federal court jurisdiction under Article Three. So I call this the scratch your head test as a judge. The federal judges have to scratch their heads and wonder what might con what Congress might do in this situation, whether Congress would be inclined or disinclined to allow a remedy and they're not sure, then under step two, they shouldn't allow the case to proceed. So let's take a look next at examples of special factors that the Supreme Court has found significant enough to deny Bivens remedy. First, look to alternative remedies. And the courts have said that these alternative remedies, and the Supreme Court has said, they don't have to be as good as a Bivens remedy. They don't have to be coextensive with the remedies available under Bivens. Alternative remedies can include administrative remedies, can include remedies in a criminal case, such as being able to suppress in a criminal constitution unconstitutionally seized evidence. Um, administrative proceedings I mentioned can be good as well. So the alternative remedies don't even have to be a remedy through the courts. Second, congressional legislation in the area. And we saw that in the Schweiker case. If Congress has legislated in the area and has not provided a remedy, then assume that Congress has decided the answer is no. Another concern, national security. Question for us here in the Southern District of California is does national security include the border? That's a very important question. And in Hernandez, which we'll see in just a minute, um, which is the most recent Supreme Court pronouncement on Abbasi, um, the Supreme Court said that, quote, the conduct of agents positioned on the border has a strong, clear and strong connection to national security. So that creates significant issues for any Bivens case arising out of the border here in San Diego. Um, next, challenges to official policies and procedures. And that makes some intuitive sense. Um, a private cause of action against an individual officer isn't an acceptable way to challenge official government policies and procedures because the private officer in defending the case may not do a good job of vindicating policies and procedures, and there are other ways to affect the outcome of policies and procedures. And then finally, and this is a factor in every case, what are the costs to the government allowing these Bivens cases to proceed? Will it increase the difficulty in recruiting employees? Will it provide a burden on the government employees and distract them from the law enforcement duties that they're supposed to be doing that they're hired to do? So that's a bossy. And the question then becomes, what's left of Bivens after this? The court didn't overrule Bivens and Abbasi and at least purported to leave Bivens you know, in the, intact in the search and seizure context in which it arose and in the common and recurrent sphere of law enforcement. And that's what Justice Kennedy wrote there. So that perhaps preserves something left after Bivens, but that leads us to the next opinion, Hernandez versus Mesa, which I'll discuss next. So Fernandez, at least, was on its surface a search and seizure case. That's the, the type of which, the, from the previous quote um, from Abbasi, may be preserved. 
I say that because Hernandez involved a classic seizure. The, the young boy was, a uh, young man was shot on the Mexican side of the border and killed by a border patrol agent. So it was a seizure. Um, but the special factors test swallowed up that savings clause in Hernandez and the court held in a hotly disputed five to four decision that the case sought an expansion of Bivens and that special factors counseling hesitation were sufficiently present such that the Supreme Court uh, wasn't going to provide a remedy. And specifically, the Supreme Court cited national security, international relations. That's what the majority relied on. And now we see from uh, the quote in the middle that the majority is now on record as believing that Bivens itself was likely wrongly decided. What the majority wrote is that if the court's three Bivens cases had been decided, had been decided today, it's doubtful we would have reached the same result. But there are only two justices, uh, Justice Thomas and Gorsuch, who would overrule Bivens outright. So Bivens still has a pulse. What they wrote is that in their view, the time has come to consider discarding the doctrine altogether and that stare decisis provides no veneer of respectability to the court's continued application of these demonstrably incorrect precedents. So Bivens survives, at least in name for the time being, but the Supreme Court has made clear that the ball is in Congress's court if plaintiffs are have a, a broader remedy against federal agents for violation of constitutional rights, broader than what's left after Abbasi. So it's clear that the clear majority doesn't like uh, Bivens and the Bivens doctor, doctor thinks it's wrongly decided, but I think there are still some viable Bivens claims out there. I think it's more difficult in our district with uh, on border related incidents, such as what Ben Hameen provided, but we'll discuss this um, later on in the discussion. Well, thank you, Judge Butcher, for all of that bad news. So I wanted to turn it over to Mike uh, to see what are the significant differences, the most significant differences between Bivens and what we call a 1983, which is a shorthand for a mechanism in which we hold um, state officials responsible. Well, uh, remember, uh, we're, we're looking, when we're looking at uh, 1983, we're looking at a statute. When we're looking at Bivens, we're looking at something that was uh, created by the court. When we're looking at 1983, we're thinking of state actors, so local police officers, sheriff's deputies, and really any other type of governmental employee, social workers, and uh, anybody who, who may um, be in a position to violate somebody's constitutional rights. When we're looking at Bivens, remember, we're talking about federal employees, federal agents, Border Patrol, Customs, whatever, FBI. Okay, so here the big difference is what Judge Butcher just uh, explained, which is when we're looking at 1983 and we're talking about violations by state and local officers, pretty much any constitutional violation is actionable. Now, there may be, you know, some minor exceptions, but we, 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 don't have, we can look at uh, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Eighth Amendment violations, and you know, we arguably have a cause of action we can bring. But as Judge Butcher just explained, on Bivens' side, what's actionable now has been shrunk and limited to a point where there is very, very little. We, we have to go back, as the judge said, and find a case with not just a Fourth Amendment case, but arguably with facts that are similar to ours. And so the very same act uh, that is committed by a San Diego police officer or sheriff's deputy, the plaintiff can bring the lawsuit and successfully recover. If it happens to be a federal agent, in, in, in many, many circumstances, that person is out of luck uh, even though there may very well be a constitutional violation. So in other words, they can violate people's rights and the person has no remedy uh, under Bivens in many, many circumstances. So I mentioned qualified immunity. We're gonna talk about that next. That applies to 1983 cases, also applies to Bivens. So you'll see that's another way for the officers to get out from under liability. Can you get punitive damages? Yes, on both. So that is, the potential is there. Now I mentioned earlier Monell claims. Those are the claims where if the city or county has a policy 
that caused the constitutional violation, the city or county itself can be on the hook. Not true under Bivens. Bivens is only against the individual officers, even if there is a policy that's unconstitutional. And then we mentioned attorney's fees earlier. Section 1988 provides for attorney's fees over and above whatever a jury awards the plaintiff for all the time that the lawyer has put into the case. No such thing under Bivens. And the reason that's so critical is this. Many constitutional violations are not cases of catastrophic injury. I mean, if you have a death, if you have brain damage, um, Certainly a lawyer, a lawyer could look at that case and say, if I can prevail on that case, I can get paid by a percentage and I'll get paid for my time. But how about the smaller cases? How about the cases where we don't have catastrophic injuries? We can pursue, we can pursue those under 1983. And in my mind, that is extremely important when we talk about accountability and also compensation for victims. We need lawyers to take these cases. And if lawyers are looking at spending two, three, four, 500 hours on a case that may only result in 25 or $50,000 in damages, the lawyer just can't take the case. But under 1983, it enables us to take cases. And my view is, wouldn't it be nice if we could take a lot of these cases that are not catastrophic and by holding the officers accountable on those cases, maybe prevent the catastrophic cases from happening. And that's one of the goals that we all who do this work have. These cases, 1983 and Bivens really, are intended to decur, deter abusive acts, uh, excessive use of force, et cetera, by government employees, particularly police officers. They're meant to deter and they're meant to compensate victims. And so the goal would be, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could prevent the catastrophic cases because we were able to hold them accountable uh, on smaller cases. Um, that leads to, well, what does all this mean to the community? What does this mean to citizens? Well, what it means is for those who are abused by federal agents, who would only have the Bivens remedy. Um, they can't find lawyers. Lawyers can't take their cases. And the reason is, for one, the court is likely, as we know now in the 21st century, to say, you don't have a viable Bivens claim. Um, and as I say, if it's a case that's not catastrophic, it's if, a, if it's a, a very important constitutional violation, and an injury that matters, but it's not a case, you know, that's, let's say over $100,000, uh, lawyers just can't, unless they're gonna do it pro bono, they can't take the case because they, they can't uh, get paid for their time. And these cases are vigorously defended. So you look at, and we all who do this work, um, and, and Ben Amin sees folks like this more than, than probably anybody, you mean they can just get away with it and there's nothing I can do? And the answer is yes. Even when they clearly have violated people's constitutional rights. And that's a, that's a very tough conversation to have for folks who have been, and in many cases, horribly abused. And you remember Ben Amin's case where that border patrol agent jumped off the trolley and says to Ben Hameen, what are you doing? You're filming me, you're impeding me. That guy was the supervisor. He was there on a training mission. All the other agents you saw in that video were, were trainees and that was the supervisor. And one of the things that uh, Ben Hameen was very schooled in is how to do what he was doing and do it lawfully. He had his camera going, but he wasn't, in, he wasn't uh, getting in the way. He wasn't impeding anybody. He wasn't being obnoxious. He knew how to do what he did lawfully. And you can see that that officer was, wanted to accuse him from the beginning 
of impeding a federal officer. And that would and why would he why would he think he could do that? Because he's been around and he knows. He thinks they'll never do be able to hold me accountable. I'll just say he was impeding me. And I'll take him into custody and we'll see if we can get him charged. And that's the message that he's sending to the uh, other agents. So uh, accountability is huge. We'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but it makes it really, really tough to prevent these kinds of abuses when there is almost no way to hold the officers accountable. So Mike, I wanna go back a little bit to what you had mentioned before, which is qualified immunity. And I think any discussion about civil rights really requires a, a discussion about that. I think it's such a hot topic right now. You have everyone from athletes to business leaders to politicians to celebrities to everybody um, talking about it right now we have legislation coming down addressing this very issue um, so we know that this is something everybody is aware of and they want answers so i think it would be useful if we got into what qualified immunity is so we can have a discussion so qualified immunity is a doctrine that was created by the Supreme Court that holds that officers are entitled to qualified immunity un unless their conduct violated clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a reasonable person would have known. So Judge Butcher, um, could you describe for us with the following slides with the justification or uh, sort of placement of qualified immunity within this context. Sure. Um, first, I'd like to respond in part to uh, the point Mike made about uh, there being no remedy if there's no Bivens cause of action. Um, that's not true in all cases. There is the Federal Tort Claims Act. So if someone was injured by the intentional act of an agent killed or whatever, there can be a remedy under the Federal Tort Claims Act and the United States can be held to, um, to compensate the victim for that conduct. So it's not quite as bleak, I don't believe, as Mike uh, portrayed it to be. And we maybe have some time at the end to talk about those, those alternate, alternative remedies and whether they're sufficient or not. Um, but with respect to qualified immunity, um, it's really more bad news um, for potential Bivens plaintiffs and more good news for the potential uh, Bivens defendants, the officers, because even if you get past this Abbasi test and the court gets, lets you leave the starting gate, and have a, a Bivens case, um, there's an additional defense that the plaintiff is going to have to um, overcome, and that's qualified immunity. And qualified immunity essentially says if the, the officer is acting, uh, at least not in violation of clearly established law, then the officer is immune from the suit. So there's some policy justifications to this that have been articulated in the Supreme Court's opinions. Um, it avoids the expense of litigation, um, by allowing these district courts to get rid of these cases at early stages and the agents to get back with their, their business of being officers and agents it requires um, a related point, requiring officers to respond to these suits diverts official energy from pressing public issues. The threat of litigation can deter able citizens from accepting the public office. They don't wanna lose their house if they make a mistake. And the fear of being sued will dampen the ardor of all but the most resolute or most irresponsible public officials and the unflinching discharge of their duty. So make some maybe too reluctant to act in a situation where action is required. But my belief is that the most significant underpinning uh, to qualified immunity is just a concept of basic fairness. So let's take a look at that in the next slide. And this is what uh, you know an individual near and dear to you wrote in, uh, well, this is not, uh, we'll get next to uh, Justice Warren, I think. Um, and what the court said here in Pearson versus Ray is that a policeman's lot is not so unhappy that he must choose between being charged with dereliction of duty, in other words, not acting when he should have, if he doesn't arrest when he has probable cause, and being mulcted in damages if he does. So that's the basic concept of fairness that underlies the qualified immunity doctrine. Thank you. So we're going to talk about qualified immunity in the context of a real case that happened in San Diego. So we're going to be discussing a case called Martin versus United States. I will read sort of the, the, the basic facts of the case and we will show you the video of what happened to Alex Martin. Um, Alex Martin was from Texas. He drove almost nonstop for 21 hours to California for a reason that was not known to his family. Um, sometime after midnight, the 
um, border patrol agents in unmarked cars saw a car driving in the wrong direction on Interstate 8 near a checkpoint. Um, driving the wrong way on Interstate 8 is a common technique that smugglers use to avoid inspection at the checkpoint. Believing Alex to be the driver of that car that was driving in the wrong direction, the agents activated the emergency light and tried to pull Alex over. Uh, the agents were dressed in plain clothes. Uh, they approached Alex's car with their guns drawn and pointed it at Alex's car. They were screaming at him to get out of the effing car. Uh, and as a result of that, Alex drove off and the agents uh, engaged in a high-speed chase. And a marked, uh, a marked border patrol caller did join that chase along with the unmarked cars. Uh, other agents stationed at the checkpoint deployed the spike strips. Alex continued to flee, but pulled over after a short distance, presumably because his tires had deflated from the spike strips. Uh, so the agents parked their cars, one to the side of Alex's car and one to the rear. And there was like a, a hill to the other side. So he was wedged into the side and to behind. Angel, um, I'm sorry, agents told Alex Martin to get out of the effing car, show me your hands, show me your hands, show me your hands multiple times. But they also told him to roll down the windows and to unlock the car, um, which would have necessitated Alex to move his hands down in order to unbuckle himself or move over to get out of the car. So he, nevertheless, he didn't immediately comply with the orders. At one point, Alex put his hands down and began moving his hands uh, near the center console of the car. In order for Alex to unlock the door or roll down the windows or unbuckle the uh, seat, he would have had to do that. The agents thought that he was grabbing for a weapon. So an agent smashed the window of a flashlight, then shot Alex with the taser. And this is uh, what happens after that. So he's smashing the window and deploy. there's a taser. It in ignited um, a fire and Alex Martin burned to death in that car. Um, and so we brought suit and at the end uh, there were summary judgment motions and the district court granted the agent's motion for summary judgment, finding that the agents were entitled to qualified immunity because their actions were reasonable under the circumstances and then Ninth Circuit affirmed. Um, so when we talk about you know, accountability and uh, the difficulty of finding lawyers, I think Mike put it so elegantly about um, because these cases are so tough and especially when the damages are low, uh, it really disincentivizes the lawyers to take these cases because it's so hard. But you know, I, when I watched that video, it, it's not even the difficulty of the case. I don't care. Um, it's, it's not that the case value is low, it's not that. Um, but what, you know, what that brings to light is you know, those phone calls that you have to make to your clients to express what happened. And it's almost indescribable. It's inexplicable to explain to a sobbing mother why she can't present her case. It makes no sense to people who have, you know, who have experienced such tragedy, why there wouldn't be a remedy. It's really an impossible thing to do. So I think for lawyers that hesitate to get into these Bivens cases is because why, I, you know, how do you make that phone call? How do you say that to a grieving mother? Um, so that that's one of the difficulties, right? Because it's so hard um, and it's at the at the end, there is such a deep sense of injustice and it's, it's on you to explain that to non-lawyers and it's almost impossible. So I, I wanted to get um, Judge Butcher's opinion about this case or any of the other cases that uh, have come down in um, the Southern District of San Diego, maybe something 
stands out for him from the perspective of law enforcement or from his office since he was my opposing counsel on Martin. Right, I, I defended the case and you know, to, to Julia's credit and Mike's credit, they don't shy away from the difficult cases. And this was a difficult case on both sides. The, the result was tragic. Uh, a young man died. I took the deposition of his parents in Julia's office and it was not a pleasant, uh, pleasant task. Um, but the perspective that I brought to defending the agents is what were they supposed to do in the situation um, that they were presented with? They saw who they believed was Alex Martin in the middle of the night driving the wrong way on Interstate 8 near Pine Valley. Um, now people have died in head-on collisions when this type of thing has occurred. You know, families in minivans have been traveling in the right direction, have been killed by people driving the wrong way. So it will, the agents, I don't think, could overlook this and simply do nothing. And then when they approached and tried to stop Alex Martin, he fled from them um, and they pursued the chase. At that point, they thought he was likely a smuggler. The, de the taser they deployed was an intermediate level of force. It's not supposed to kill anybody. Um, he was resisting their commands. He had demonstrated that he's not going to comply by fleeing at high speed. So in balance, and the argument I made that both uh, the district court and the Ninth Circuit accepted is that the officers acted reasonably under the circumstances. Um, the taser wasn't supposed to kill anybody. It's, a, it's not a lethal level of force. What caused the car to explode? Nobody knows to this day. Um, obviously there was something, some, some type of fuel that vaporized in the car that caused the, that got ignited in the spark. But let me make a broader um, point in case we run out of time about qualified immunity. Um, and the question to consider is whether there should be some daylight between constitutional violations that are violations and constitutional violations for which there should be a remedy against the agents. In other words, should the constitutional violations be reserved for clear abuses of powers when there's a clear constitutional violation? Um, so let me give you just one example. I just saw it in the news this morning. The Ninth Circuit's considering an argument um, that by the California schools denying students in-person learning during COVID, that violates a supposed 14th Amendment fundamental right to an education, um, which is a right that up to this point, the Supreme Court has declined to exercise. Now, if the Ninth Circuit agrees that this 14th Amendment right resists, then should the affected students and their parents be permitted to bring a civil rights lawsuit against the personal assets of the school administrators who closed the schools and recover damages from them? So if the answer to this question is no, then there ought to be some daylight between constitutional violations and personal liability um, in these types of cases when there's cl no clear guidance for officers who act in good faith. Um, so there needs to be, arguably, if you agree that the, the administrators shouldn't have to lose their house or their income for what they presumably um, decision they made in good faith, um, then there needs to be some form of protection, whether you call it qualified immunity or something else. But that's a, a discussion that we can have if we have any time remaining and get uh, the perspective of others on that. Sure. I, so I, I think that's really the one extreme. And also, uh, I, I think I would dispute some of the, the statements because there is in California at least mandatory indemnification of officials. So it, especially involving police officers, you never see them paying because it's always through self-insurance and through um, excess insurers. So it, it's, it's a requirement by statute that the peace officers don't pay out of their own pockets. The other extreme that we see day to day, I'm sure Mike has a, a whole series of cases. So to give you an example of another kind of qualified immunity case, we had a recent case in California called Jessup, where these officers conducting a, um, a search of a home with a search warrant stole $225,000 worth of gold coins and cash. That's not in dispute. What the Ninth Circuit held was that these officers should have known that it was morally wrong to steal $225,000 gold coins. But how would they know that that's unconstitutional because there wasn't a case before that clearly established stealing is unconstitutional. So we have a whole series of those cases. I mean, you really, it's such a difficult thing for the plaintiffs because in order for you to prevail, 
in order to uh, prevent the officer from getting qualified immunity, you have to prove that they were plainly incompetent or knowingly violated the law. And I don't know if people really understand how low that bar is for plainly incompetent. We're talking about officers who can't tell the difference between a gun and a taser, a gun and a taser with the officer who took out her Glock semi-automatic and pointed it at her partner's face. And then she later shot a kid in the backseat of her car who was in handcuffs because she thought she was using the taser. No court addressed whether she was plainly incompetent. And the initial court said that, well, that she said she, was, she made a mistake. It was an honest mistake. She didn't mean to kill the guy, so she's entitled to qualified immunity. There was a reversal, but it really, the standard, I think, for a plaintiff is nearly impossible. Uh, Mike, do you have another example? Yeah, I was thinking uh, uh, of, of two. One is a local case. It's uh, called Emmons versus the city of Escondido. Uh, and, and, and that was interesting because they, they were the police were at the, uh, somebody's home about a uh, domestic dispute. And the subject of the domestic dispute was now outside by the swimming pool or something. But anyway, another man comes out, an older man comes out of the house and uh, the officers told him, uh, I think, to leave the door open. And in any event, there was a, a somewhat of a dispute about what happened. The man said he was just, he didn't hear the officer, he was closing the door. But in any event, they grabbed him from behind and slammed him down on the ground um, and inflicted relatively minor injuries. But, you know, they, they slammed him down on the ground. So the question in that case, it went up to the US Supreme Court, believe it or not. And the question was, well, are the officers entitled to qualified immunity? The US Supreme Court sent it back to the Ninth Circuit because the Ninth Circuit hadn't, in the Supreme Court's view, properly analyzed whether qualified immunity applied. So meaning, was, was it clearly established that you ought not slam a guy down on the ground if you don't know he's the suspect and he's not uh, endangering you in any way. Well, back to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said, well, we can't find a case where uh, facts like this already existed. And the Supreme Court said that this man was engaged in active resistance. We don't have a case where you couldn't throw him down in those circumstances, so they get, the officers get qualified immunity. So contrast that with a case that I had where officers come upon a guy, um, they think he might have thrown something uh, at plainclothes officers. He's standing there, and as soon as they get there, he's not moving. They spray him in the face with pepper spray. They reach around and grab him and slam him down on cement. His face has a face plant, and he's got some very, very serious facial injuries. Now, the rub on that in the trial court was, well, if he was engaged in only passive resistance, then they can't do that. And there's plenty of cases that say that. And that's what the jury found is, well, he was, a, he was not engaged in any resistance. And if he was any, he was passive. So there were plenty of cases that say you, you can't do that. And so therefore the court said, no, you can't have, or ultimately the, 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 the city didn't even bring the motion because they knew they wouldn't get qualified immunity. So, you know, the, the, it, it can kind of go either way. Um, the other place where I think, uh, well, I'll say one other thing about qualified immunity. It was created by the court, completely created by the court out of whole cloth. So we heard that the Supreme Court was being critical of Bivens because there's no statute that authorized Bivens cases. And yet the Supreme Court, there's no statute that authorized qualified immunity but the Supreme Court has applied qualified immunity with great relish, but uh, there's no statute that provides for it. But uh, I did have a case where the city had an ordinance, you probably don't know this, but the city of San Diego has an ordinance that says it's illegal to stand on the sidewalk unless you're as close to the curb as possible or as close to the building as possible. Now, nobody's ever heard of it. It was passed in 1938, but uh, an officer knew about it and he was going to stop this guy to write him a ticket for it, ended up breaking the guy's arm. Well, 
the, the trial court said that statute's unconstitutional. It's just too vague. But the officers, they, they should get qualified immunity because they're applying a statute that they, they have no way of knowing it's unconstitutional. So to me, that's a place where the city would be liable, but not the officers. Oh, you're muted, Julia. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so we've received some questions from the audience that Sherry Green from the law school will be asking our panelists. Sherry? Great, thank you. So I have a combination of questions that were submitted with our event registration and then some that have been submitted live today. And so I'm going to select some of those. And so uh, the first one, are there groups of people outside of law enforcement that are protected? For example, medical practitioners, public entities. Was that addressed to Mike, Sherry? Yes, Mike, do you wanna take that one? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm so <laughs> in, in the background, my dog is barking. Oh, no, 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 I'll repeat the question. So are there groups of people outside law enforcement that are protected? For example, medical practitioners, public entities? Yes, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, protected by qualified immunity, yes. So you can have doctors, for example, who are accused of constitutional violations in the jail and if they're sued for constitutional violations, deliberate indifference, doctors and nurses, they would be entitled to qualified immunity as well. So it does apply to anybody who is accused of constitutional violations. Thank you. And this one is um, for Judge Butcher. What is Bivens applicability to white collar crime? Well, it can apply equally to white collar crime. Um, for example, if an officer goes out and makes an arrest of a, on a white collar arrest warrant and excessive force is used, it can lead to a Bivens claim just like a, a drug bust, for example. One of the last cases I handled at the U.S. Attorney's Office arose out of a white collar criminal prosecution in Los Angeles, the Central District of California, where two FBI case agents, two FBI agents were case agents in a securities fraud pump and dump criminal prosecution. And one of the defendants um, obtained a dismissal of the case um, after he raised some issues with respect to the propriety of the wiretap. And then that dismissed defendant turned around and has sued the two FBI case agents under Bivens um, for, um, for arrest without probable cause and issues with respect to search and so on. Um, the district court initially threw out the case under um, Abbasi, um, but the Ninth Circuit reversed part of that, and there is still a viable Bivens case to this day pending in the Central District arising out of a, a white collar um, criminal case. Great, thank you. I think I'll turn it back to you, Julia, to kind of work on wrapping up and talk about what the future holds. Yeah, so we only have a couple of minutes at the end, but I wanted to open it up to uh, the, the panelists to see what their um, thoughts are about what the future holds. I'm gonna go first to you, Judge Butcher, if you have any thoughts. Well, Bivens is unique uh, because unlike other questions of constitutional law, the, the, the issues that it raises aren't off limits to the political process. Mike mentioned the issue with respect to qualified immunity in 1983, that can be fixed through legislation unlike other constitutional issues. Um, there's as we know, a hearty debate over Bivens and qualified immunity. Um, the question that's now front and center is who should be making these decisions? Who should be deciding what the scope of civil rights cases are against federal agents and what the scope of qualified immunity is? Judges or justices who are appointed for life or the elected representatives of Congress whose job it is to balance these competing policy considerations, make value judgments and pass appropriate legislation. Um, the Supreme Court has essentially tapped out of that uh, um, that role. It's re-examined completely the propriety of its involvement. And by doing so, I anticipate that Congress is going to receive increasing pressure um, to increase its involvement through legislative solutions. So stay tuned. It's far from over and it's well worth paying attention to because they're very interesting issues um, and the issues are, are important. There's a, a whole lot at stake. Thank you so much. I see that unfortunately we are out of time. 
So I just wanted to say um, in conclusion that we're all so lucky to practice in San Diego where there is such a high level of civility and professionalism. It was a joy to be here with all of you. And on behalf of all of the panelists, I just wanted to thank the uh, University of San Diego Law School for this incredible program. Back to you, Sherry. Great, thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining us uh, today. You know, we really enjoy our annual Bergman lecture and being able to um, have such incredible and, and great discussions. And so thank you for that. Um, on behalf of uh, University of San Diego, the law school, our law alumni association and the alumni association, we invite you to continue to participate in our upcoming events and activities. Um, our programming is robust and there's a lot going on. And so you can always visit the law school's website as well as the alumni website to access those events. And also I'm excited to share uh, our big event that's coming up next month is our big give and our big give bash. So be on the lookout for communications for that in your inbox and um, please stay well, stay safe and um, have a great day. Bye.